Imagine you're the leader of a small rural village community. A tall man of grand stature looked upon for guidance for those in need, especially as head of the local Catholic church who bears a great amount of influence for the local population. And it was here at the current time that all was well and prosperous in your village. The people went about their daily lives, working hard outside, producing farm goods, and eventually completing their daily tasks to survive another day. And when the time came, celebration commenced, with everyone calm congregating together to enjoy one's company. You, meanwhile, from afar, looked over this community in the midst of its festivities and see no ill to come over your people, as this simple way of life should have been enough, where you give your regular Catholic sermons, providing a sense of clarity and purpose for those lost in their path. But one day, you are approached by a man who hails outside of this village, promising a new way of enlightenment that could only be achieved by abandoning your current religion. Of course, any sane person may question the motives behind this outsider. So how much damage could really happen if we follow the outsider's proposition? I mean, as someone who was looked at as a moral compass for the local community, I'm sure you wouldn't lead them to their own destruction, ruining this once prosperous village and tainting it with a new way of life, where one would show their full devotion to a parasite, being told that if you receive this organism, that your blood would be cleansed of sin, hence returning back to the notion of finding true enlightenment as spoken by that outsider. So against your better judgment, you you accept this influence from the stranger, changing the very core of your religious beliefs. And once that's done, here again, as leader of this small village community, you look down at your people from afar, and you see the change that has occurred after accepting this pagan faith. As you lead your people in a new way of life, serving the once outsider as your new lord, and sharing his influence among your population. Once that's achieved, you can then look at yourself in the mirror and come to accept your new identity. As Chief Bitoris Mendes, leader of the village found in the Valley of Wolves, and now a devout member of the Los Illuminados. The downfall of Batoris Mendes and the village community could be explained from two fronts, with the first was the newly opened occupation of excavating the ruins under the Salazar Castle, where we would follow one of the villagers named Rodrigo as he explains the daily lives of the village community and how things progress moving forward. Then second was Osman Sadler's manipulation of Father Mendes and how this would spell bad omens for the people he led, with both of these factors playing the crucial role that would change the people of this community forever. Ever. So with that said, let's first delve into the circumstance from Rodrigo's point of view and how this once peaceful village community changed for the worse. So Rodrigo's story was covered in the Resident Evil Incubate series, which covers several chapters of events prior to Leon's mission in Resident Evil 4, which here I will read the full series of events and try to fix some of the translations from the passages, and I will add some touches of changes here and there to give a bit more fluidity to the story, because as it progresses along, we start to see the madness that Rodrigo undergoes, impacting his writing about the events that would unfold. So with that said, let's begin this tragic and sad tale of the village's downfall from Rodrigo's point of view. In this village, there are smiling children, good neighbors, and a heart that cherishes the old. The modest life is filled with small joys. The village has maintained peace by preserving its customs and culture. In this gentle flow of time, I was born and will return to the earth. I love this village. I wish that the same beautiful scenery will continue forever. So I decided to paint the village from time to time with my brush. I will write my grandmother's name in the corner of my paintings so that my grandchildren and their children, whom I have not yet met, will know the beauty of this place. The sowing season has arrived. Men work hard, as do women, and preparation begins here and there. I went to the farm in the clear morning sun. Sweat glistens on the foreheads of the strong men tilling the soil. The women helping them sang, chatted, and were very lively. At noon, we all spread our lunch boxes for a moment of relaxation. The bread my wife baked for me soothes the waves. Now I have one more task ahead of me. Working in the fields is like raising a child. With the kindness of the villagers and the bounty of nature, the earth will soon be fertile. Children help take care of the chickens and cows as I did when I was young. When I went to the barn, I saw a boy carefully carrying a bucket full of cow's milk with his small body. Most of the villagers are related by blood, and the whole village is like a big family. 
they always help each other and have a strong bond with one another. When this boy grows up, he will know that even the smallest actions help the village. Then on one occasion during a holiday afternoon, a friend invites me over for lunch. He told me with a bit of pride that he was happy to be in service in his prestigious job as an excavator at the Salazar Castle. This along with many other strong men from the village. As this lunch with my friend proceeded, a delicious meal was served, but the best part of the meal was the family reunion. This house too has kept its old tableware and furniture. Like my own home, it is a simple life but it is neat and tidy. Looking outside, there is a small flower bed in the garden and the family members are asked to line up in front of it to pick up a brush. When I draw a picture and give it to the child as a thank you for the lunch, he gives me a cute smile and says, thank you. Thank you for the food. In this village, there is a story that has been passed down from generation to generation. The story praises the first castellan of the castle, known as the ancestral member of the Salazar family, who was said to have punished paganism with his crusade to exterminate the evil parasite worshipping cult known as the Los Illuminados, where its followers were executed and the parasites sealed under his castle, establishing both peace and the Catholic religion that we still see to this day. Thanks to him, this village exists and we are all safe and sound. Most of the time, the grandparents tell this story to their grandchildren while the parents are at work. In the next house, a grandmother was teaching her granddaughter how to sew, and I imagine that one day, she too will tell her grandchildren the first Castellan story while knitting or sewing. The first lord of the Salazar castle was a righteous man who protected and loved the villagers, but now Lord Ramon is… hmm. <laughs> the long-awaited harvest time has arrived. This year's crops were so good that it will sell for a high price to neighboring towns, which will allow us to buy gasoline and many other things that are not available in the village. All the villagers are working hard to bring the crops and carry the vegetables to the trucks, and even though it is hard work, the children are doing their best to help. The children are the village's treasures, and it is as if the villagers are raising them on their own backs. It is everyone's wish that the children grow up healthy and happy. When we finished our work, dusk was already approaching, and tomorrow is the harvest festival. Today is the harvest festival to celebrate a bountiful harvest and give thanks to nature. We ate well, drank heavily, danced in a circle, and looked up to see the beautiful stars in the sky. The night is getting late, but the children, with their parents' permission, are also up late. With all the villagers enjoying one's company, it's one of the few times of the year when the village can afford to tolerate such an event, and this evening is no exception. Usually we all work hard, but on these special occasions, we all celebrate together. Some recite poems they have written themselves, some family members sing in chorus, and finally a man with a guitar sings in a husky voice, expressing his gratitude. The village was filled with a sense of happiness as everyone smiled in embarrassment at the ovation, and in the midst of this festival, I noticed that the village headman was nowhere to be seen this year. But since Petorus Mendez is also a priest, he was probably too busy with church work to make it to the festivities. Here, people cooperate to obtain food, which is then distributed among everyone. They gather the produce from the village, milk from the cows, eggs from the chickens, fish from the rivers, nuts from the trees, and the other things bought in town, and bring them back to their homes. On another day, I help load their goods onto my younger brother's wagons, who lives nearby, and we drive the produce together out of town and then later we head back home. Looking around, I enjoy seeing the sun filtering through the trees, the birds singing and chirping, and the flowers along the roadside looking beautiful as always. When the brother's family comes out to greet us, both he and I smiled. Then one day out of the blue, the village chief, Betoras Mendez, had told me to gather all the villagers the following Sunday. He didn't tell me what the announcement was, but regardless, I was just told to tell everyone in the village. So the day has arrived. Everyone from the village has gathered per the request of Father Mendez. During this congregation, the father spoke his part and then handed the reins to another fellow. Here he had us listen to a sermon from this unfamiliar
familiar man, probably someone from the outside world. I was told that this gentleman, Mr. Sadler, is a very important person in the cult of Los Illuminados, which Father Mendez was a great admirer of. He came all the way to the village and spoke for hours of wonderful stories for the villagers. He said that by having sinful people like us undergo a blood purification ritual, our souls would be saved and we would be blessed with even greater happiness. Hmm, the sinful, huh? I wonder if he was already like that. My friend who invited me for lunch that one time. Because ever since then, he has since changed from this gentle nature to someone who suddenly started to lash out. It was terrifying. He said that if you don't undergo the ritual, he won't be happy. The Order is trying to protect and save us. Thank God, we are so grateful we found salvation. The blood purification ceremony will connect all hearts and purify the impure blood. So with that, I along with the other villagers lined up to have their bloods purified. And then it was my brother's turn. Suddenly, he looked at me and cries out, Brother, help me! and refuses to participate in the ritual. I told him that the villagers must not lose a single person in order to be united as one, explaining to him that the rest of his family had already undergone the ceremony and that it was his turn to accept the ritual. On that day, we villagers learned the truth. We learned that the first lord of the Salazar castle was jealous of the Los Illuminados and interfered with their good deeds and that his last descendant, Master Ramon Salazar, was the one who had made a great contribution to the revival of this cult. For hundreds of years, we have been told a false story, truly unbelievable. Shortly after, I noticed my wife has been coughing a lot lately, as if she had caught a cold. After dinner, our daughter suddenly started foaming at the mouth, her face contorted in pain, and her arms and legs flailing wildly. We must help her. Oh my god, my daughter, my precious daughter is gone. I looked at my wife, who was standing there with a blank expression on her face. I I can't believe this happened. N no, I don't want to believe it. My head starts to hurt like it's going to split open, and the blood in my body is so hot and painful that it feels like it's going to spurt out. The next moment, I shuddered in surprise at my own words, which I shouted to my daughter, You useless b****. After that, I rushed to my brother's house. Something was wrong with him. There were traces of blood on the floor, and I was told that he sprawled out in agony. Then looking at him, he stared at me with madness in his eyes and said things that made me want to cover my ears. Then in a matter of days, all the children in the village were gone. The precious children were all gone. Not a single one alive. I noticed that more and more of the adults turn their crazy eyes and lose their emotions. Strangely, they all go on days without eating, mumbling, sometimes cursing. Then one morning, I started to vomit blood. The chief sent me this message. By order of Lord Sadler, if any stranger comes here, take him out. I will kill them as soon as I find them. The man in front of me suddenly had his head cracked wide open. It's a miracle. The rest of the villagers saw this. We all rejoiced, great Lord Sadler. What is your next command? So after reading this tragic and sad tale, he gives us a great overview of what truly happened to the villagers and how this once happy community turned into madness. Though a lot was covered from Rodrigo's story, there were some key information that bridges to the other front that caused the downfall of this village population, with that being Rodrigo's interaction with a friend who worked in a prestigious job of excavating underneath a castle nearby. This particularly was the Salazar Castle, the same one that the first Castellan headed centuries back. A file found in RE4 notes on what occurred during this occupation and the consequences that follows, where it reads, The first Castellan buried the Las Plagas deep underground below the castle to hide their very existence. But when Salazar released the Las Plagas, no one thought he could bring them back to life. Because when Salazar found them, they were all just fossilized remains. Everyone knew that the parasitic organism could not survive without their host, that they couldn't sustain life on their own. But when Salazar and his men excavated the remains, it almost appeared as if the Las Plagas were just waiting to be discovered so that they could resurrect. Several years later, unexplainable convulsions started occurring among the villagers who helped with the excavation of the Las Plagas. Then one day, all of a sudden, these villagers turned into violent savages. They later found out it was caused by the Las Plagas. Although they appeared fossilized, they were able to survive the long years by lying in a dormant state at the cellular level, remaining in a spore-like form. Although during the 
excavation, the villagers inhaled the spores, and within their bodies, the parasites became active again. This is how the Las Plagas were resurrected. Even as I'm writing, the excavation of the Las Plagas continues. God only knows how many of these plagas have been resurrected, not to mention the countless number of ganados that have been created. Their inhumane activity must be put to an end. If they are not stopped, people around the world could turn into victims of this crazy cult organization. So from this note, it again reaffirms the actions of the first Castellan as he sealed the Las Plagas parasite underneath his castle, making sure that it will never see the light of day again. This was all for the sake of keeping the Los Illuminados from ever returning back to power. Unfortunately for the first Castellan, his last descendant Ramon Salazar thought the opposite, where he would help Osman Sadler revive the Los Illuminados, unsealing the Las Plagas parasite from his castle, and continue to have the innocent villagers excavate the ruins, knowing full well of the repercussions of this job and leading to the parasite spores to spread among the population, creating more of the Ganados, which was already on top of those who had their bloods cleansed with the goading of Betores Mendez, thinking it would purify them of their sins. And speaking of Betores Mendez, his role of letting Osmond Sadler manipulate him and changing his Catholic beliefs into this pagan parasite worshipping cult only magnified the atrocities that occurred in this village, though we don't know the exact details of the conversation he had with with Sadler and the process of manipulation that went on during that time, we can only insinuate that Sadler had what they called a silver tongue, where he was able to effectively communicate his grand vision for the world and convincing Father Betores Mendez that his way of enlightenment was the one true way of salvation. The big cheese. So with our background lore surrounding Father Betores Mendez covered, let's go ahead and explain his role during Resident Evil 4 and how he tried to impede Leon during his mission in this game, with our introduction to the Big Cheese happens shortly after finding Luis Serra. Ah, little rough, don't you think? You're not like them? No. You? <clears throat> okay. I have only one very important question. Do you got a smoke? Got gum. Perfect. The big cheese. What? The importance of this timely acquaintance with Luis Serra was paramount because Chief Mendez was on the hunt for this individual, which later it was found out that Luis initially worked as a researcher for the Los Illuminados, where he experimented in many ways that could make the Las Plagas harder to remove from the body and even make it stronger. Though some time later, Luis did become disillusioned with the future plans for this parasite worshipping cult, and in the process of trying to leave the Los Illuminados, he stole a sample of a dominant plaga. This caused Sadler and the rest of this cult to scramble looking for him. The Big Cheese notes on this event where he states, The whereabouts of Sarah is still unknown. Most likely he's using an old secret passage taught to him by his grandfather, who used to hunt this region long ago. I'm pretty certain that he's hiding our property somewhere in the forest. If his grandfather was still alive, I would have used him to find Sarah. But how did he find out about the egg injected in his body? And the fact that he was able to remove it before it hatched is concerning. Another factor that concerns me is that Sarah escaped with our property just before the American agent arrived. I don't believe that was just a coincidence. There has to be another player involved in this. In order to settle this whole situation, we have to capture Sarah and wait for the effects of the drug to wear off before we inject him with another egg. Once this is done, whoever is behind all of this will surface. Nobody shall interfere with our plans. Those who do shall suffer severe consequences. 
So the important information found here was that Luis was able to find a way to remove the Plaga egg from his body. Second was the non-coincidence of Leon's mission inside of the village, which coincided with a third-party infiltrator. Additional documentation was noted in regards to this topic, where it states, Alert order. Recently, there has been information that a United States government agent is here investigating the village. Do not let this American agent get in contact with the prisoner. For those of you not yet informed, the prisoner is being held in an old house beyond the farm. We will transfer the prisoner to a more secure location in the valley when we are ready. The prisoner is to stay there until further notice. Meanwhile, do not let the American agent near the prisoner. We do not know how the American government found out about our village, but we are investigating. However, I feel that this intrusion at this particular time is not just a coincidence. I sense a third party other than the United States government involved here. My fellow men, stay alert. So after reading that, we can tell that the Big Cheese knew something much bigger was going on. With the surrounding circumstances that was in action, couldn't have just been a coincidence. Of course, later, we learned that it was Ada Wong that was a third-party infiltrator, and her current mission at that time was a mystery to all involved early in the story of Resident Evil 4, with her debut happens right after Leon was able to escape alongside Luis, where soon after he makes his way towards the Chief's residence. Here, while investigating, we get another close encounter with with Chief Mendez. You carry the same blood as us, it seems. Nevertheless, you're an outsider. Just remember, if you become unpleasant to our eyes, You'll face severe consequences. What? Same blood. So several important key takeaways we need to cover here was that Chief Mendez was aware that Leon was infected with a Plaga Parasite. Then second was Ada's reveal, confirming his suspicions of a third-party infiltrator. Chief Mendez laments on this with another note, while he questions Sadler's intention of keeping Leon alive, where here he states that, as instructed by Lord Sadler, I have the agent in confinement alive. Why keep him alive? I do not fully understand what the Lord's intentions are. I would, however, think he'd keep them separate, not confine them together as has been ordered. I don't expect Luis would trust a stranger, but if by chance they did cooperate, the situation could get a bit more complicated. If for some reason an unknown third party is involved, I don't think they would let the chance like this slip by. But maybe it's all Lord Sadler's ploy, leaving us vulnerable so that this third party will surface, if they even exist that is. It's an unlikely possibility, but if a prowler is already amongst us, then our plans could be ruined. I guess the Lord thinks it's worth the risk if we're able to stop whatever conspiracies at work. At any rate, it's the Lord's call. We will trust his judgment as always. So with that said, we don't get to see much of Chief Mendez for the rest of the game. That is until we have to face him in a boss battle at the outskirts of the village, acting as the last obstacle that keeps Leon from heading towards the Salazar castle nearby, where he gives us one last note, speaking on this very topic as the last defense, where he states, I clearly underestimated the American agent's capability. He's still alive. I thought we could wait until the egg hatched, but at this rate, he could destroy the whole village before it does. We must take Take care of this nuisance. We shall change our priorities for the time being. We will cease our hunt for Luis and ambush the two Americans. There is a building used to enlighten betrayers just beyond the point where you get off the lift. It's a perfect place for ambushing them. If all else fails, they still would need to face me in order to get past the last gate that leads out of the village, for only before my sight will the gate open. 
What's interesting to note here was Chief Mendez was able to move very fast, with barely a shadow passing by Leon's point of view. Here he finds himself at the mercy of the big cheese. What's more was the raw strength that he displays, being able to twist two metal door handles, making sure that Leon has no means of escape. Of course, we already got some hints to some of Chief Mendez's superhuman-like abilities with his encounters prior to this boss fight. What's more is that we have to take into account his overall durability and the potential amount of fatal damage he was able to withstand, resulting in his mutation. Here we can see that he had a dominant form of the Plaga Parasite. Compared to the many Ganados we've faced throughout this village, this would allow Chief Mendez to be fully cognizant of all of his actions, being able to control those of lower Plaga ranking, and with the only person he has to answer to was with Lord Sadler. So with that said, the pressing issue at hand was how Leon was going to deal with this mutated version of the Big Cheese, looking absolutely terrifying, having a centipede-like spine that elongates his overall body, the claws that he was able to protrude, and the sharp tendrils coming out of his back. To top this off, even once Leon was able to deal enough damage causing the split of Chief Mendes in half, he was still able to survive this predicament, adapting very fast, using those long tendrils on his back as a way to move around the setting. Though Eventually, we are able to defeat him, providing us with the means to open the gate towards the Salazar castle, hence ending the Big Cheese's role within Resident Evil 4. So we finally got our first glimpse of Betoris Mendes in Resident Evil 4 Remake, and largely from these very short scenes, not much has changed, giving us the glimpse of his mutated form, and then with his base appearance, where he still seems to have that grand stature that he portrays. Of course, with the added top hat that he now has, a lot of RE fans have compared him to the likes of Mr. X, deeming him the tyrant of RE4, which on a side note, does that mean we can shoot off that hat like we did with Mr. X? But besides that point, the only other detail that we got from him was this small narration. Your soul requires cleansing. This sentence refers back to how the villagers were infected with the Las Plagas parasite after being manipulated into joining the Los Illuminados, reiterating the notion of cleansing one's blood of sin by receiving the Plaga parasite, which I do hope in RE4 Remake that they cover this prequel event in some capacity, showing how Father Mendez was approached by Lord Sadler and how he was able to manipulate him into abandoning his Catholic faith and joining the Los Illuminados, also maybe showing the process of the villagers' conversion into madness giving us some insights on their lives before and after receiving the Las Plagas parasite into their body. But with that said, we can only speculate on what's to come in Resident Evil 4 Remake, and it won't be long until we get further information in regards to Chief Mendez and his new portrayal in this reimagining of RE4. Anyways, what are your guys' thoughts on the Big Cheese? And are you guys happy with the way he looks from the RE4 trailer shown from the Resident Evil showcase? Please let me know your opinions in the comment section down below. Also, if you guys enjoy the content, then please Please feel free to like and subscribe for more videos like this in the future. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, you guys have a great rest of your day, and this is Hey Deva, and I'll see you guys in the next video. If you become unpleasant to our eyes, you'll face severe consequences. <laughs>